Check, check, one, two. Okay, gonna get started. Good morning, friends. Welcome back to Zine Dreams. I'm Jen De La Vega. This stream is an exploration of independent zines and commercial magazines, how they're structured, how they're made, tips for curation, and other ways to express yourself with printed media. I am so tired. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Good morning, Lucius. Nice to see ya. Hey, Brandon, what's up? Thanks for joining. I am so tired because... Uh, we did our very first Fun City live show during Gen Con last night, and yeah, our we were at the 10 p.m. slot, and usually I get sleepy around 10 p.m., and so we were up until like, you know, one-ish. Hi, Matt. Good morning. Um, I don't know if you caught last night's live stream, but uh, we had a very special edition episode of Fun City. Like, it has been months since we played Shadowrun. So we've been playing Still Fleet and practicing Still Fleet um, for a mini series, but uh, for Gen Con, they asked us to come back to Shadowrun just for one night. Um, thank you. Yeah, the show was really fun. Taylor definitely was on his A game, I agree, last night. Um, our, our moderator slash producer, Eric, uh, you might see him on Twitter as Eric Vulgaris. Um, he clipped like Taylor's speech last night as the villain and I gotta say it is one of the funniest villain speeches I've ever heard in my life it is like undead slash cyberpunk slash economical <laughs> I don't know it was ridiculous um, but we had an adventure in Greenwood Cemetery last night, which is totally coincidental because um, Mike and Taylor wrote that episode, I think, a while ago. And yesterday I had like a, a semi-viral tweet about Greenwood Cemetery yesterday. Um, yeah, so Greenwood Cemetery is in Brooklyn and it's gigantic and it's kind of like a park that you can visit and walk around. And uh, Martin actually shared with me yesterday a link to uh, an audio tour that you can get on Bandcamp of Greenwood Cemetery. And in Time Out New York, Greenwood Cemetery um, is the first cemetery to offer an artist in the residence. So people can apply to make art in a cemetery and you also get 
access to 2,000 personal items of the deceased. And there are like super famous people in this cemetery, so it's, it's kind of insane. Um, so last night's adventure was really, really fun. You can watch the whole thing on um, the Twitch channel Gen Con TV, G-E-N-C-O-N TV. And we were one of the most recent broadcasts. Um, but yeah, last night uh, I was very, very tired. Um, but I, I enjoyed so much looking through the chat afterward and just like re-watching parts of it. Um, I felt like... Oh, we've been playing Still Fleet for the last couple months. It might be hard to jump back into Shadowrun, but no, it was like riding a bike and, and jumping back into the Viv character is very fun for me and um, very happy to be playing with my friends. Uh, yeah, true, Matt. Uh, I did look like I was physically trying to flee. Every time we record with Taylor, I physically have to like back up because Taylor's voice is like, Boom. And it doesn't matter who he's playing. His voice is just like the highest peaking amplitude on any recording that we do. <laughs> like his voice gets to this like shrill timbre that my body can't handle, but it's kind of amazing. Um, and it's really funny when Taylor has conversations with himself like as multiple characters. Um, so highly recommend watching that if you missed it. Uh, he is like a vocal chameleon. His range is absolutely crazy. I agree. Um, I hope to have that kind of a range. I mean, I have little Mercus and then I have Viv. <laughs> That's all I have right now. <laughs> I do like speaking in the Mercus voice. <laughs> anyway today we are talking about zines I might um, not go as long today because I'm super tired and I have some bike deliveries to do today because people have ordered food from me but today we're gonna uh, look at a Kickstarter project called stock tips and it's not the kind of stock tips that you're thinking about uh, it is broth or, or chicken stock you know soup stock stock tips and we're gonna look at a commercial um, pamphlet um, that is kind of zine formatted um, from Vermont Creamery, which is one of my favorite uh, cheesemakers. And um, at the end, I'll just briefly skim through uh, my cookbook. I know I've like mentioned it a bunch of times, but we've never actually like gone through it. So uh, I'll show you what's going on in here. Um, there are, if you can't afford a cookbook right now, um, I have like so many of the recipes online. Um, it's on my website at uh, www.randwitch.es. You can you can find a lot of the free recipes there. Um, but this is like one direct way to support me and the stream. Uh, my publisher, well, be basically, I'll rant about this later. But the publishing industry is broken, and authors don't really get to see that money directly unless we get author copies and try to sell them on our own. So that's what I'm doing with my book. Um, but I'll get into that later. Um, yes, Martin, buy okra futures and corn futures. Apparently, corn will have a resurgence back in, in 2101. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to get into this first zine here. Actually, no, I have a question for the chat. Is there anything cool that you've read this week? Um, the Greenwood Cemetery uh, artist residency was a big hit on my Twitter today or yesterday. Um, I don't remember how many retweets I had. It was insane. I think it was like the most retweets I've ever had on anything. Uh, let me see. Yeah, tell me what y'all been reading. Have you not been reading? Why? <laughs> I want to know. I want to know. Even if it was like a new uh, tabletop game that you've been reading, like I want to hear about it. Yeah, 63 retweets. That's, that's crazy to me. Like I usually get like one or two. Matt says, not zines, but you just reread Swords and Deviltry and about to start on Neuromancer and Faust soon. Oh, yeah, Neuromancer. Been a while. Your uh, Lucius is reading Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. It's pretty good. Really? I didn't even know he had a book. I mean, I guess a lot of famous people have books. I don't know. Uh, Martin's been reading a science book on United States geology. Wow. Geology. Do you have a fun fact for us to share about from the United States geology? Uh, 
Oh, okay. Matt's reading Blades in the Dark game is coming weekend as well. Haven't read the rule book. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. I get it. Trevor Noah's book is about apartheid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. So we're going to get into stock tips. I can't read the signature here. Let me see. Uh, stock tips scene Kickstarter. The authors are Rachel. No. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I should have looked this up beforehand. This is how tired I am, y'all. Amy. Her name is Amy. It doesn't say their full names. Okay, so it's by Amy and Rachel. I believe Rachel was working at Tumblr at that time. Rachel Fershleiser. That's her last name. Um, she's really uh, involved in the book and publishing industry. Um, so it's amazing that she made a, a zine, which is, you know, opposite of, <laughs> of the industry she's <laughs> in. Uh, okay. So stock tips originated as a tag on Tumblr. Rachel started blogging about soup and offering advice to others on how to make their soup and stock better. Meanwhile, Amy was traveling through South America, learning to make a soup called Caldo Gallego and communicating with everyone back home only through her zine, Charm Offensive. When the two of us started talking about soup and zines, we knew there'd be more people out there who wanted to talk about both. Thus was born the stock tips you're holding in your hands, my hands. Um, we have a bunch of excellent writers, artists, and bloggers who have contributed recipes and soup love for your enjoyment. Um, yeah. The art of cookery. So um, this is very DIY. It looks like they cut out a lot of paper stuff and then re-collaged it and then uh, copied it to make to make the. Actually, the cover looks inkjet direct. Yeah, it's glossy. So the uh, the back the cover is inkjet and then the inside is all copies. So we have a little illustration here. It says, Art of Cookery. You want to write a version of yourself that's you in Concentrate, a bullion cube version of you. That's a quote from Meg Woolitzer. 922, 2013. Okay, so that's, that's dating this zine. It's 2013. Um, this is really exciting. I'll just read the contributors list really quick. Uh, oh, here's her last name. Amy Greco. Kate Gavino, Rachel Fershleiser, Alexander Chi, who is a very um, notable writer right now, Arielle Browse, Jamie Green, Kate Christensen, Emily Gold from Emily Books, wow, Amy Plitt, who is a local New York writer, Beck Schwartz, Sarah Eileen Hames, Nosley Samadzade, excuse me, um, Delia Paunescu, Beth Griffin Hagen, one of my friends. Uh, Dave Bry, Becky Lettenberger, Claire O'Neill, Kevin Nguyen, oh, who, who writes with Bijan at The Verge, uh, Jamie Attenberg, Kevin Clark, Liz Shannon Miller, Preeti Chibler, and Jen Northington. That is a loaded lineup. Wow. So many publishing people in this. Okay. S stock tips from the Cook's Own Ladles by Rachel. I know nothing in particular about cooking. I like to claim old Jewish lady cred for my chicken soup, but neither of my grandmothers taught me anything. Basically, I made this all up. It's the only correct way to make chicken soup forever and ever. Amen. Some deeply held beliefs. Don't use box stock. Okay. In tomato or squash soup or quinoa or risotto, sure. But when you're eating a broth-based soup, for God's sakes, make it. It's not even hard. Acceptable cheating. Buy a rotisserie chicken at the grocery store and start there. I agree. Any chicken soup that is liquid at room temperature is BS. That's why boxed canned soup won't help you when you're sick. You require gelatinous fatty magic to coat your throat and make you better. Science schmience, I believe this with all my heart. Accessible cheating and sickness desperation. Order in chicken soup from a Polish diner or similar. Agreed, I do like a Polish chicken soup with dill. Um, another deeply held belief. Anytime you eat anything with bones, stick them in a baggie in your freezer. Add leftover onion, herb stems, etc. until you have a gorgeous bag of garbage for soup making. <laughs> and more rules here. To be offered, ob uh, observed in soups or broths. Oh, rules to be observed in soups or broths. So that's like middle English. <laughs> observed. Observed. 
Um, oh, it really is get. It is hard to get Polish food in the Bay Area. I guess I never thought about that. It's very abundant here in New York, so uh, it's so funny. How I make chicken stock. Take some chicken parts. I like thighs best. Season them over with whatever you like. Smoked paprika is excellent. Roast in the oven. Much more flav flavorful than boiling it raw. Alternatively, you can already have a leftover chicken carcass you started with cooked or start with cookie cooked deli chicken. Excuse me. Drop in that pot and add shallots, cut in half, garlic, bay leaves, peppercorn, rosemary, dill, your freezer baggie, and or whatever you like. I don't approve of carrots and celery. Whoa, that's blasphemy. What? <laughs> I've always been taught to add carrots and celery to broth. Uh, but this person is not does not approve of carrots and celery. Our Parmigiano rind is a wonderful addition. Fill the pot with mostly water, not to the top. But you can use the pan you roasted in or the package the rotisserie came in. Uh, to add the water, you'll, you'll pick up extra drippings, which is good. Boil, then lower to a simmer. Leave for hours, stirring occasionally with a wooden spoon. In a pinch, an hour will do. Three-ish is better. True. Um, I always advise uh, that meat stocks should only take about four hours. Um, vegetables, too. Like, you really shouldn't be simmering vegetables for more than four hours because they'll just get really mushy and, and make your stock very cloudy. I know, I agree. She says no carrots or celery. I think that's just per personal preference, but I think she's missing a lot of depth when it comes to the flavor. Um, cool to a non-dangerous temperature. Yes, true. Pour through a strainer into a big bowl, put the chicken on a plate, and trash the other solids, rinse the pot. At this point, most people tell you to skim the fat off the stock before using it. I don't believe in removing the fat. I agree. I also say to leave in the fat. The fat is delicious and rich and throat coating and will keep you strong, happy, and healthy forever. Yeah. How I make chicken stock into soup. Put the stock back into the rinse pot. Shred the chicken with your fingers. Put the good parts back in the soup. Bring it to a boil. Add some noodles. Not too many. They grow and slurp your soup. Don't listen to people who boil them separately. <laughs> I, I agree also. Unnecessary. Uh, I like eggy soup noodles best, but you can do orzo or pastina or alphabets or pretty much anything. When they are softened, add frozen corn, fresh kale. Uh, salt and pepper is needed. Taste it a lot and don't over salt. The above is my ideal, but you can always add parsley, tortellini, and grated cheese, or leftover rice or quinoa or black-eyed peas, anything else you have. You can always put an egg on it. Ah, oh, yeah, put egg on it. <laughs> um, so that was the author, Rachel's uh, walkthrough of stock tips. I won't read through everybody's, but this is really cool. Um, Alexander Chi is somebody who is a pretty, like, famous writer right now uh, he wrote queen of the night and um how to write an autobiographical novel and i'm maybe a third of the way through the latter book um but he is a korean american writer who spent some time in mexico uh as a teenager which is really a wonderful um snapshot into his his teenage formation but um he's a great person we've been following each other online for Oh my god, since 2013? Wow, for like seven years. Um, but a long time ago, uh, I, I was really, really active on Tumblr. It, to this day, is actually where I have the most followers. I have like 15,000 followers on Tumblr. Um, but I was sharing like my daily sandwiches, random sandwiches, experiments in the kitchen. And um, when this book, uh, this writer from page six. I actually don't remember her full name because she isn't worth remembering. Uh, she had a, a Tumblr called 300 Sandwiches where her boyfriend told her, um, I will propose to you if you make me 300 sandwiches. And it was this really grotesque, like, flex of masculinity over her. But she made a Tumblr of 300 sandwiches and it was like a countdown to when she would be engaged. And then he did ask her to marry her after the 300 sandwich. But it was just this horrible, like hostage situation and she wrote a book about 300 sandwiches and it's just like my favorite quote from a review is this is a book of lies <laughs> it's just messed up it was just like the premise is bad and um her sandwiches weren't that great and so alexander chi who had been following me on tumblr um just like shouted me out and was like forget this 300 sandwiches mess like follow randwiches instead and that's kind of how i got a lot of my early followership. Um, so Alexander, I, 
I absolutely adore you and <laughs> thank you for believing in my sandwiches. Um, but here's a recipe from him in, in the stock tip zine. A few years ago, I learned how to make this stew. The first version I found was made with chicken, cabbage, sweet potato, and the Korean hot pepper broth, like some Korean chicken version of a New England corned beef dinner, and I loved it. I have since freestyled it and now use a dashi to start it off with in honor of my Korean grandfather, who, in the story of courting my grandmother, told of how he was an island boy and a little distrusted by her family. He's from Narodo, a tiny island with about 200 people on it, off the southeastern coast of Korea. I feel like they use seaweed, kombu in this case, as they are close to Japan. But also island style for New York City where I live, thus island style dak dori tang. I'll read you some of the ingredients here. I know, Tumblr drama. Ah! Um, one good sized piece of kombu, uh, eight to 10 pieces of chicken, one to two large sweet potato. Ooh, a Korean soup with sweet potato, hell yeah. Uh, green cabbage, white onion, garlic, Korean chili flake, uh, kochuchang, uh, soy sauce, toasted sesame seeds, honey or agave, and scallion. Oh my god, this soup sounds delicious. Dak Dori Tang, island style by Alexander Chi. Um, you have a handwritten here from, our handwritten recipe from Ariel. It's called Es Gesund. Oh, oh no, that's not the name of the recipe. That's how she says, eat in good health. In 2007, after a year-long bout of mystery illness that left me weak and in constant pain, I was diagnosed with celiac disease. Going gluten-free got me strong and healthy. Plus, it gave me a new appreciation for non-cookie-based comfort foods. But matzo balls, as you say, Lucius is your favorite chicken soup. Uh, glorious, luscious, reassuring matzo balls were off limits. They seemed relegated to the realm of crusty dinner rolls, cannoli shells. I could pine for them nostalgically, but I probably never had the chance to taste them again. Now, thanks to the internet, the internet, heart in all caps, I've been able to use um, food blogger experiments as a jumping off point for my own. Eureka! For matzo ball soup, you need chicken stock, one egg, Quarter cup blanched almond flour. Interesting. Tablespoon finely ground flaxseed meal. Half a cup potato starch. Kosher, kosher salt, salt and pepper. Um, fresh dill and flat leaf parsley. Carrots and celery. Fascinating. I've never heard the combination of almond flour, flax, and potato starch before. But apparently it makes for a great matzo ball if you're gluten free. Um, okay. We got Grandma Martha's cabbage soup. This is Jamie Green. After my parents divorced, my mother would cook this for my dad, send him off on Friday evenings with their daughters, and have a stack of frozen Tupperwares of this, his mother's recipe. Uh, has a large head of cabbage, two beef shanks with bone, two lengths flank, flanken, oh, flank steak, uh, large can whole tomatoes, red pack, one large onion, kosher salt, no pepper. Whoa! This uh, Grandma Martha's cabbage soup sounds a lot like bulalo, which is a Filipino soup um, that I've had in Tagaytay. Uh, it is bone marrow with beef shank, cabbage, uh, and potato. It's really, really easy. It's one of my favorite soups. I like to put um, stale day-old rice in it because the rice is like a sponge. And it soaks up all that like fatty beef broth. Except we don't put tomatoes in ours, but this is cool. Yum. It's really easy, really short recipe. Ah, let's see. We've got Kate Christensen sharing a New England fish soup. I like these fish graphics at the top. You see these? They were cut out and pasted. Like, not cut and paste on a computer, but actually cut out with scissors and pasted with glue. <laughs> or tape. Um, New England fish soup. Mince one large onion, three med medium carrots, two celery ribs, and seven or so garlic cloves. Old Bay seasoning. Oh, smoked paprika. Yum. Uh, chorizo, black pepper, red potato, half a bottle of easygoing dry white wine. Fish soup. Chop a pound of haddock or other firm white sea fish. Bring to a boil. Light the kerosene lantern and eat your hot supper while the rain lashes the windows. What a great sentence. Light the kerosene lantern and eat your hot supper while the rain lashes the windows. Oof. Let's see. 
My Soup Evolution by Emily Gold. Emily Gold is also someone who followed me early on in the Twitter game and the Tumblr game. Uh, she had a business called Emily Books, which I think is not in business anymore. Uh, but she specialized in the digital pu publication of books, and it was a more alternative way to um, get authors their first publications. Eh, eh, she's really cool. Um, in 2007, I had a secret blog called Heartbreak Soup, named after the Gilbert Hernandez comic, of course. On it, I posted what was then my best recipe for chicken soup. I told everyone about my secret blog almost immediately. 2007 wasn't my finest hour. I'll read you some of the ingredients. Chicken, one head of garlic, exclamation point, a big knob, exclamation point, of fresh ginger, a bunch of leeks, two carrots, good, quotation mark, olive oil, sea salt or kosher salt, two parsnips or parsley roots, uh, I think because I didn't know the difference, uh, <laughs> then, candid talk of a UTI and the sex, ew, that ew caused it, <laughs> written at 4.52 a.m., the parenthetical, what, it's my fault people leave their Gmail open, <laughs> now it's seven years later. The events detailed in that manic, strange, cringe, enduringly earnest blog became the basis for my first book, and then the heart says whatever. Also, I learned how to make way better soup. Oh, that's cool. Soup growth. Oh, and then she has a modified 2014 version of the recipe. Chicken, garlic, clove, leek or onions, carrot, celery, that's it. Wow. Oh, and you add spinach, noodles, sautéed veggies at the end. Very nice. Uh, we have Amy Plitt. The, base, the best basic vegetable soup. Why is this the best? There are many reasons. It requires little to no work. Chopping vegetables is the most time-consuming part. It's mostly made from ingredients you probably have on hand. If you don't, stock that pantry. There are a myriad of ways to adapt it and make it your own thing. And most importantly, it's comforting and delicious. Yes. Necessary ingredients. One cup each. Chopped onion, celery, and carrot. Yes. One to two cloves of minced grated garlic. Or minced or grated garlic. One can, yes you can, uh, diced tomatoes, a uh, can of beans, four cups of stock, chicken or veggie, handful of greens, dried bay leaf, Italian seasoning, couple squirts of sriracha, mm, and a one cup of short pasta, ditalini, small shells, or orzo. Fun. And then she has a whole list of ways that you can um, adapt it. Yes, the Amy Plitt. Yeah. Yeah, this is a recipe from that Amy Plitt. <laughs> Um, veggies, bean, tomato, sriracha, pasta, freezing. The soup freezes beautifully, so make a huge batch. Okay, Beck Schwartz shares a vegetarian tom kha soup. I went to Southeast Asia after my mom died because I was sort of going crazy and it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Understandable. It was great when I wasn't having a bit of a breakdown. <laughs> Boy, do I relate with that. I did lots of wonderful things and cried an awful lot and toward the end of my time away, I was back in Bangkok to see some friends. I took a vegetarian cooking course because Thai food is the best. It was right before Christmas and I was the only student which meant that I made and ate all of the food. This is my favorite soup in the world. Okay, wok cooking. A wok heats up real nice and fast so you have your stuff all cut up before you start cooking. Mise en place, as the French would say. I don't know how you would say it in Thai. <laughs> Uh, you could also totally make this in whatever vessel you normally use to make soup. I'm not going to judge. Oh, what a wonderful little illustration by Sarah, Sarah Eileen Hames on the opposite side. Look at that. Cute. Uh, the ingredients are a soup bowl of water, four kaffir lime leaves, four slices galangal, four half-inch pieces of lemongrass, uh, veggies like carrot, onion, broccoli, mushrooms, or uh, <laughs> peppers, or whatever. Tofu, dark soy sauce, light soy sauce, two teaspoons palm sugar, two teaspoons lime juice, one teaspoon tom yum chili paste. Cool. That sounds delicious. Oh, except for the coconut milk. I can't have that. Yeah, it is a really nice illustration. Um, this is Soup Match by Nosley. Oh, she wrote a grid here with A, B, C, D, E, and F, and then you can pick one from each. Uh, the word for cook in Farsi, which literally means, wait, what? 
Oh, it's a game soup match. Okay, so she has like these statements and you have to match it to a box. The word for cook in Farsi, which literally means soup maker, and it's a uh, letter C here. I don't know if you can you can read that. I don't know how to pronounce it in Farsi. Uh, the greatest soup-related rap lyric of all time from Be Healthy by Dead Prez. Lentil soup is mental fruit and ginger root is good for the youth. Very nice. Number three, the worst soup ingredient ever. Ugh, any kind of spinach, it turns to mush. <laughs> um, the correct ranking of soup types. Let's see. Uh, lent no. Creamy, stewy, and brothy, she says. That's her opinion. Oh, here. Oh, here, here. Listen. To make Iranian chicken soup. Saute potato cubes in olive oil. Just wait until their edges glisten. Add carrots, bouillon, and four cups water. Then simmer until the potato, potato is tender. Add tomato sauce and vermicelli and simmer until the noodles are done. Stir in the parsley, check for seasoning, and serve with lots of lime juice. Oh my god, that sounds great! Wow! Iranian chicken soup. Lovely. Delia's Beginner Butternut Squash Soup. What you need. Butternut squash, shallot, garlic clove, potato, mushroom, carrots, chicken stock, thyme, olive oil, and creme fraiche. <gasps> First mention of creme fraiche in a, in a soup zine. This is great. Uh, what's next? Beth Griffinhagen. She's one of my friends. You got 99 problems, but a biscuit ain't one. Ooh. <laughs> That's fun. Simple soup solutions. Too thick, add about a quarter cup or half a cup warm stock water, warm milk or cream, or coconut milk. Is your stock too thin? Add some pasta or rice. Serve with crusty bread or add a big pinch of flour and stir like hell. Um, I say if your soup is too thin, make a cornstarch slurry, which is a uh, half a tablespoon cornstarch with, with a tablespoon of water. Mix that cold and then stir it into your hot soup. Because if you put cornstarch in hot stuff, it'll just lump. So you need to constitute cornstarch in cold water before you mix it into hot water. Um, if your soup is too blah, Beth says, add a little salt and pepper. Add some more salt, probably. Add a little zest and juice from a lemon or a lime. I agree. Uh, except for in the case of cream soups, I would not add a lemon or a lime. Instead, I would stir in a little miso. Yeah. Not, or a flour slurry or a roux would work. Uh, if your soup needs to look fancy, top with a dollop of creme fraiche and swirl with a knife. Shave expensive cheese on it with a dollar sign. She has that for the S's. Snip in some fresh herbs or add a spoonful of pesto. Agreed. Or learn to say it in French. I agree. Uh, saying, um, vicious soie is way better than saying cold potato soup. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a soup recipe for idiots. One box tomato soup. Uh, one bag boil in a bag brown rice. Half a block pepper jack sliced. Heat soup. Add rice, then cheese. Squeeze in lime. Des it. <laughs> so good. Um, we got a piece here from Dave Bry. Two soup lunch. They call me two soups. Sometimes, and by they, I mostly mean one person. But it's a person I uh, eat most often with so they she calls me this because i order two soups for lunch like instead of soup in a sandwich i order or a soup or a salad i'll have a soup and another soup a different soup i like soup that much i can relate that i can relate to this <laughs> when i was little and we would go to jewish diners i would get um mushroom barley and the matzo ball yeah double soup it's great I know, vicious wad. That does sound better than cold soup. <laughs> Bouillon. Beef, beef stock. <laughs> Bouillon. <laughs> it's stupid. I could spend like an hour just reading French from the Jacques Pepin Techniques book. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> I don't even speak French. <clears throat> One of the reasons it started is because of a really funny Monty Python sketch about a symphony composer named Arthur Two Sheds Jackson. Two Sheds earned his nickname by considering a building 
uh, considering building a second shed in his yard and telling friends about it. Though he never actually had a second shed built, the nickname stuck. He is unhappy with it because he'd rather be known for writing symphonies than for almost once a long time ago having two sheds in his yard. But hey, that's how it goes. If you've ever seen this skit, I urge you to look it up on YouTube and watch. It's terrific. Another reason I think has to do with the word soup itself. It's a really great word. Funny and pleasant to pronounce and satisfyingly onomatopoetic. Soup sounds like slurp or sip, words that describe how it sounds to eat soup. So it sounds like the sound it makes if you hold your spoon or ladle at the surface of your soup and plunge it under the surface quickly. Kerplunk is a word often used to describe a sound like this. But unless you're dropping your spoon or ladle into a soup from a height of two or three feet above, soup is more like what you hear, the sibilance of displaced liquid, the hard pop of the pee as the vacuum you've created defeats surface tension. Oh, what a great sentence. Soup, say it aloud. Wasn't that nice? And two soups is even funnier and more pleasant to say because it sort of rhymes. So there you have it. More about me than you probably would ever have wanted to know. Uh, da -da -da. So it's a whole piece about why he, <laughs> why this person has two soups. Uh, this is from Becky and Claire. Perfect soups for special occasion. The occasion. Ugh, why did I mix tequila and red wine? The soup? Pozole. The gist, stick, steal Rick Bayless's recipe and basically boil pig parts with spices and hominy. As always, it's all about the garnishes, crunchy, bright veggies, and lime. I recommend radish with that. Slurp or no slurp? It depends on what, I, what it is. I think with noodles, totally okay to slurp. Otherwise, I don't really slurp because my, my teeth they just don't fit on the spoon that way. I don't know. I, it's just weird. Um, the occasion, yay, I'm getting a root canal. The soup, root veggie soup. Roast your favorite root vegetables with a garam masala and ginger. Wow. Saute your favorite aromatics, bring it to a boil, and puree. Wow. That sounds lovely. The occasion. I'm trying to seduce you. The soup. French onion. Buy real beef bones and make a real beef stock. Reduce tons of onions forever. That's funny. Stonesoups.tumblr.com. Let's get the real instructions on our soup blog. And it's got this collage of a little kid holding a giant rutabaga. Um, okay, we've got from Kevin Nguyen, uh, Mies phone re Mies pho, pho recipe. This is a recipe for chicken pho, not the traditional beef pho, but this is what I grew up with, and it's better and healthier. Oh, me is, uh, or me is Vietnamese for mom, in case that wasn't obvious. I didn't know that. Uh, one whole chicken, two legs with, th with thighs, two sweet onions, one piece ginger, about four inches, one celery, one carrot, half cup fresh uh, fish sauce, not fresh, excuse me, um, and one tablespoon of sugar. Wow, and he's got it annotated here, which is really cool. I like it when um, people write uh, afterthoughts in the margins in the recipes. The Unlikely Chef by Jamie Attenberg. I'll just read you the, the first paragraph here. My grandmother died when my mother was just 11 years old, and consequently my mother never learned to cook particularly well. Certainly she had cousins and aunts who passed on bits of knowledge here and there, but she was taught to cook as part of her public education. Water, she could boil. Recipes, she could follow. But with a single father raising two young girls, my mother lost some skills along the way. Therefore, I did not learn to cook either. Instead, I have become a superior dinner guest. I'm wonderful to have at your side while you cook, particularly if you give me a glass of wine, and also to have sit at your table. Because I appreciate your food in a deep, emotional, highly verbal way is perhaps in small part because I did not get to experience that kind of cooking growing up. Wow. And it's a whole essay about this. Oh, there's a line here. Aha! The final ingredient. Guilt. Boy, can I relate. Okay, where are we now? Uh, Secret History of Shitty Beef Stock by Kevin Clark. I'll read the, uh, the excerpt here. When you want to make great beef stock, you might leave some meat on the bones, but what you're really after is the connective tissue in the joints. You want it to dissolve into gelatin and make your stock all thick and sticky and delicious. That takes a long time. Any meat that's left at the end is soft and tender and falls apart right away. But that's not always how they did it. For a shockingly long time, Europeans thought that if you boiled some meat a little bit, the meat would get tough and gray because the good stuff had already been seeped into the water. Briat Savarin, who did much of his eating in the pre-revolutionary France, thought you could get the precious osmosome out of meat by simply leaving it in cold water, and that the extractable parts came out through light boiling. But that gelatine was something else entirely. 
Wow. This com I'm going to read most of this, actually. This completely non-gelatinous beef stock was seen as halfway between medicine and food, and the 18th century French called it at a restaurant because it restored your vital energy. Restaurant. Oh, that's where the word restaurant comes from. In 1765, some shops in Paris started selling it on the street, and now we've got a whole industry named after shitty beef stock. In the middle of the 19th century, the German chemist Justus von Liebig got very excited about the exact same substance. He proclaimed it nitrogenous, the probiotic of the day, and the very, very best substance for health and nutrition. But our friend Liebig didn't stop there. Beef was phenomenally expensive in Europe and so cheap in the South America that after slaughtering cows to make leather, you just let the meat sit and rot. If only someone could come up with a way to get the extractable parts out of the meat and preserve them for shipping to Europe. Enter the Liebig Extract Meat Company. They set up a shop in Uruguay, among other places, and proceeded to make shitty beef stock in enormous quantities, turned it into little dry powdery cubes, and ship it back to Europe. And so the stock cube, too, was born from shitty beef stock. Someone else mixed a similar extract of beef with more dried and ground beef in England and created Bovril, which is now owned by Unilever, who now owns the domain name soup.com. Good for them. That's a great piece. Uh, we have Green Soup by Liz Shannon Miller. When I got into soups a year ago, I was very recipe dependent. Then I figured out how easy soups are. So the below is, a, uh, is less a recipe and more a guide to creating your creamy green vegetable soup of your dreams. Your dreams, very specifically. And so here's a, a really long guide about uh, the kinds of vegetables you should get, the kind of allium, what kind of stock you should use, uh, and the flavors. So it's really cool. Your dreams. Okay, we're nearing the end here. Uh, PD Dal by Preeti Chibber. Dal is, a, is standard in Indian cooking, the first food I remember loving, and my mom's Pili Dal with rice. It's pretty much perfect. Two handfuls tour dal is pigeon peas. Uh, green chili, pinch grated ginger, half teaspoon dania jeera, which is a blended spice of ground cumin and coriander, uh, teaspoons of turmeric, salt, a pinch of hing or asafoetida powder, pinch cumin seeds, two or three smashed garlic cloves, a quarter teaspoon ground masala, and oil. Wow, that sounds delicious. Pigeon pea soup. Mmm. Uh, Jen, Worth Jen Northington says, cross stitch this. Soup's on, bitches. And it's in the style of the uh, zine cover. Stock chips. <laughs> That's great. Cross stitching. Maybe I will. Great idea. Know what's cool? A bullion dollars. Scandal. This soup zine photoshop. Did soup zine photoshop the cover bisque? Can't really swim in a pool of gold coins, but soup, hell yeah. Soup jokes by Nick Douglas. Oh, no wonder. <laughs> I was like, mm, what are these jokes? <laughs> 20, 20 ways to make your BF burp in bed. Photo spread. Ryan Gosling will eat his soup. Stock tips. If you make chicken soup, you are technically a doctor. Soup billionaire publishing magnate. Oh, okay. So that's the end of Stock Tips by Rachel and Amy. This was a Kickstarter project made by a Tumblr employee way back in 2013. I don't know if they actually have any more of these, um, so I'm going to keep this one. I don't, I don't know. I, I think they may have uh, sold out. But they have an, a Gmail if you are curious. It is stocktipszine at gmail.com. Nothing about stocks or trading, only soup. Wonderful. <sighs> Next is more of a business pamphlet than a zine, but it's in a zine format. Um, so I go to a lot of uh, specialty food events, and I hang out a lot with cheesemakers, which is so fun for me. And one of my favorite booths to hang out with is Vermont Creamery. Um, and I love their cheese. They do all goat milk cheeses and uh they recently well not recently maybe two years ago had a rebrand and um it's really gorgeous and they debuted it in this pamphlet slash i would say this is a zine not really a pamphlet because it's got like lots of pages but it's gorgeous fun fact um this photo this cover photo is uh my friend erica kubrick's hand 
She is an Instagram uh, influencer, like cheese influencer, and she is known as Cheese Sex Death, if you want to follow her. But this is a, f a cheese porn shot from her, and they used it on the cover, which is really, really cool. Uh, you'll never eat anything we don't believe in. And so this is like formatted like a zine, but it is has a purpose of selling cheese. So keep that in mind. Um, so it's like one long advertisement. Instead of being a publication that has advertisements sprinkled in, this is an advertisement. For over 30 years, Vermont Creamery has been consciously crafting delicious goat cheese and European-style dairy products. Continuous improvement is a big part of who we are, so we're making some changes. Don't worry, not the delicious dairy part. Since Bob and Allison's first day on the farm, we've taken time to perfect every detail of what we make. If it doesn't feel right, we make it better. If we can't make it better, we just don't do it. From two young visionaries, our company was born. 34 years later, we're still here in Vermont, fine-tuning our craft. We know that great things happen when our team comes together. Wonderful. Adeline, President Vermont Creamery. I like that she doesn't put a last name, you know? It's like we're, we want to be on a first-name basis with her. Um... The, th the more things change, the more they stay the same. Our dairy tastes better because it's made better. And they're a certified B Corporation. And they have, like, uh, beautiful pictures here. And then uh, you'll probably see noticing our fresher look. And so it has, like, the rebrand, like, explained here, which is lovely. Uh, fresh goat cheese. Oh, my God. Look at this food photography. I love it. Yum, yum, yum. The Vermont Creamery Stories begins with this mild goat cheese milk hand-rolled in delightful and surprising flavors. Crumble on salads or flatbreads or mix into quiches, dips, or souffles. Ooh, crumbled goat cheese or high-quality fresh chev crumbled for your convenience, made with, without mold inhibitors or cellulose. Melt it into paninis or quesadillas, sprinkle on roasted veggies or salads. Boom, look at that beautiful food porn. Oh, and I love this. They have some new line art also. I have a, uh, an enamel pin of this goat. It's like red. Uh, the, the pin that I have is red. Sorry. I think it's on my jean jacket. Whatever. Uh, spreadable goat cheeses. Fold into pasta or spread on sandwiches. Use as a ravioli filling and cannoli uh, or serve as a dip. Those are some great ideas. And then here's some applications of the spreadable goat cheese. This is a really pretty pamphlet. Creme fraiche, delicious cultured cow's cream with a thick creamy texture. Dare to dollop, oh what a great sentence. Dare to dollop on pies and tarts in rich soups and stews. Speaking of which, that's what we, we were talking about. Uh, if you will need to uh, thicken or enrich a soup, add some creme fraiche. Ooh, maybe you'll have a goat cheese salad for lunch. The advertising is working. <laughs> Mascarpone. Ridiculously rich and velvety Italian-style cream cheese. Magical ingredient in tiramisu and cheesecake. Swirl into risotto or pasta. Ooh, I've never put mascarpone in a risotto before. Sounds a great, like a great idea. It's beautiful. I think we're near the end here. Cultured butter, oh my god. Can I tell you how much I love cultured butter? When I first discovered it, uh, how to make it, uh, I just had been making it for a while. Uh, um, Cook Science has a, a breakdown of how to make cultured butter by yourself, but um, I highly recommend it. It's a little funky. It's not for like everyday use because it's so fancy and like funky, but um, silky smooth cultured butter with a cult following churned to 80%. 86% butter fat, just add bread. Perfect for pan searing and finishing sauces, bake into pie crust, cookies, and cakes. Oh, what a spread. Look at that. Lovely. And Bunny Bouche, our flagship of our aged cheese collection. Hand ladled, ash ripens, loved by all. As it ages, Bonnie Bouche becomes creamy and more robust in flavor. The flavor is fresh and lemony. The texture is fluffy and creamy. And that's the cover image here. That's, that's Bonnie Bouche. Did you know that goat cheese can get this uh, weepy? It looks like a brie. Yeah, goat cheese can still act like uh, bries and, and uh, bloomy rind cheeses. Lovely. Lovely, lovely. 
1984. Wait, Vermont Creamery is just as old as me? That's funny. I didn't know that. Uh, and then the ending page says, Join us as we write a new chapter in a story that started once upon a time on a little goat farm in Vermont. And I love their typeface. Their typeface is gorgeous. It's very them. It just makes me feel so happy, right? Just looking at it, I'm like, oh, Vermont. I want to go to Vermont. I want to pet some goats. <laughs> Good advertising. Um, and a brand that I like. No, uh, yeah, no, uh, there was not a, not a paid appearance. I, I genuinely like them. <laughs> Ooh, mascarpone is good on bagels as well. I did not know that. I didn't try it. I've never tried that. That sounds great. Um, and then finally, I just want to, like, skim through the table of contents of my cookbook. I, I'm sure I've shown it to you multiple times, just the cover, but I've never actually, like, spelled out what's inside of it. Um... So I have an Etsy shop, and I'll just rewind. So four years ago, I, um, I got a book deal, which was a huge dream of mine, and I was sort of conflicted because it is a small publisher, and I didn't have exactly have all the terms that I wanted when I first entered into this agreement, um, and we also didn't um, account for, like, 2020 where book sales aren't really like a thing or that they're dictated heavily by like Amazon sales and so um, at this point wh what happens in publishing like maybe maybe agreements are getting better like now in 2020 but back then um, the agreement is they give you a, uh, an advance of money to write the book and you have to sell against that advance of money uh, to make money. So I don't actually start making money until I sell enough copies to make X amount of dollars from the advance. And I can tell you now that all the book reports that I've gotten back from my publisher have had the number zero. So I have made zero money on this cookbook that I made four years ago. I've sold hundreds and hundreds of copies through Amazon and all of that money has gone back to the publisher. And um, so... I was really like frustrated about it and uh, wondering when I will ever get paid for writing this book. And uh, so I took it into my own hands and every author has like some kind of agreement with the publisher uh, about author copies. So I get a 50% off on author copies. So I buy them, pay for the shipping and then sell them at cost in my Etsy store. And that is the most direct way to support me as a writer instead of buying it off of third-party sites like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and whatever. Um, but if you want to support local bookstores, I would say from now on, you should uh, search for that title, or any title, not just my book, on IndieBound. So IndieBound.com is a collection of all the independent bookstores across the U.S., so you can put in your zip code and then it will tell you where the independent bookstores are. And during pandemic, a lot of these independent bookstores are still shipping. So um, that's a great website. If you don't know who they are, IndieBound.com is great for supporting independent bookstores. But specifically for me, I have my cookbook in my Etsy shop and uh, I've been mailing out copies. And the advantage here uh, versus buying it from a bookstore is that mine are signed and that I can flag recipes for your um for your specific diet yeah a book advance is pretty much a loan you, that you don't have to necessarily physically pay back it's just that you have this outstanding like debt with the publisher yeah so i don't have to give money back from what they gave me it's just like the book the books in the warehouse are, are like slowly paying against that advance yeah um, but the thing they don't tell you about when you write a book is that in contract, there is a specific amount of time that needs to pass. This is relevant to a conversation that's been happening, happening on Twitter with the music industry. So there was a Spotify CEO that was like, uh, you shouldn't be releasing music if you're only going to release three or four, uh, 
every three or four years, which is total BS because people make things all the time. Um, that cadence is like part of an old model. And I think the same with, with book publishing. Like it's just really old. We need to turn it up upside down on its head, which is why I don't feel bad about like, you know, putting it on Etsy and trying to hustle for myself. Um, anyway, I have these. I'm signing them. Uh, I'm flagging recipes. I'm also doodling. Uh, it's been really, really fun. Um, but for those of you who don't have this yet, um, it's okay if you can't get a book right now. I, I have lots of, co I have like a hundred copies still. Uh, but there are a lot of free versions of the recipes online. If you go to my website, www.randwitch.es, uh, and go to the blog section or search the website, uh, you can find recipes for chili, um, some of the barbecue stuff, a lot of the sauces. Um, I've had to, to post those to promote the book in the past, so that's why some of them are online. But, I mean, the book is fun. I like, I'm really proud of it. I food styled the whole thing. Um, that's usually delegated to a separate person. Um, for those of you who don't know how cookbooks come together, there is a whole team behind uh, making of a book. So there's the author who writes the words. There is an editor who makes sure that the words, you know, look good and that the order of the recipes makes sense, like the logic of it. Um, there's a photographer and then there's a food stylist um, and there's a recipe tester. Um, so I was three of those things. I was the writer, the tester, and the food stylist. Um, so I should have known to charge for all three of those jobs instead of just for the one. Lessons learned. <laughs> but um, let's just go quickly through the table of contents just um, so you know what you're getting into. Uh, the first chapter is called Bring It to a Boil, which is... Um, all the chili recipes, there are nine of them. And uh, chili is like a cook-off, uh, what's it called? A uh, cook-off staple. That's kind of how I got into professional cooking and for cooking for a lot of people uh, was chili cook-offs. And so my first chapter is all chili. Oh, Fitz Murphy, you're so kind. It's a beautiful cookbook, the art, the text, recipes. It's very nice. Thank you so much. That makes me, thank you. Um, Ah, so happy. Thank you. Uh, so here's like the very first chili in the cookbook, which is one of the first chilies that I entered into a contest. Holy moly. That's what it's called. Lots of puns. So many puns. And then the second chapter is called Roll With It. Uh, it's all meatballs. Roll with it. I have like, at the beginning of every chapter, there's like lessons learned, like all the mistakes that I made. <laughs> test, test, test. When you embark into uncharted waters, you need to budget the time to test. It isn't enough to think that your recipe is good. Consult friends, family, roommates, or coworkers when taste testing. You're not just cooking for yourself anymore. Your recipe must appeal to a wider spectrum of palates. When scaling up a recipe, add the original stated amount of salt. Fry a test piece and taste it before adding the rest of the salt. It will likely be less than you think. Meatballs are great for parties because you can vary the size depending on their use and bake trays at a time. Let's see. I've even got some vegetarian stuff in here. <laughs> and a few recipes for sausages. Winner, winner, bacon dinner. Guess what this chapter is about? Lots of bacon. Uh, my favorite recipe from this chapter is the bacon chili oil. I was trying to decode the Xi'an Famous Foods chili sauce, and I didn't quite nail it, but what I landed on was still really good, and it has, like, chunks of bacon in it. Let them have their secret sauce. I've made another. Oh, this was a fun one. This is a free recipe you can get, actually. Oh my, shumai from uh, World in a Pocket. My friend Mackenzie Smith came from Texas to shoot uh, this recipe with me at the Kickstarter office. Um, so that recipe is for free online if you, if you want it. Um, next chapter is light it up because there's a lot of grilling. I love grilling. I lit up the grill yesterday to make a pizza. I'm the only person in my neighborhood who will light the grill for, to make a pizza. 
Um, there's carne asada, chicken mole, uh, flatbreads. I don't know if it's worth it, but I was thinking of either starting a stream or a podcast, uh, kind of annotating these recipes, because now that I'm like a chef chef, I wrote this like a long time ago, and so I've learned a lot more in those five years, and so I think there are things I would change from this, but uh, I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if people would care or want that. <laughs> The next chapter is crowd control, which is more of the brunchy group dishes or things that are friendly for parties or potlucks. I don't know if I've told you this story, but um, when we were shooting this cookbook, um, cookbook shoots are always an, on a very like tight schedule. Uh, we only had five days to shoot 50 of the photos and uh, uh, a normal pace is five recipes a day to test and shoot but we did 10 a day, which is a lot to manage. Like the inventory shopping of those 10 recipes, prepping the food, cooking it a la minute before we take the photo, take the photo, clean up that recipe, stage the next one. I did shoot at Project Parlor. So each day of that photo shoot, it was like a 14 hour day um, all week because, so I would do all the shopping on Sunday prep Monday morning, bring it over to the photographer's house in the Lower East Side. We would shoot 10 recipes and then I would pack every all the food that we had made. I'd pack it up and we'd bring it to one of the bars in the cookbook. So uh, Project Parlor was one of them. So I invited a bunch of people to come eat a meal at Project Parlor and we used those photos for some of the shots here in the book and on the cover. So like all the outdoor shots are at Project, Project Parlor, Union Pool, and my house. So my, my roof, I had, a, I had a roof deck at the time. I currently do not have a roof deck anymore, but like that's what my old place looked like. Yeah. Um, it was a really tough photo shoot. So like prepping, cooking, photo shoot, and then run to shoot with people and the cooked food somewhere else. And then the nat that night I would have to do, I would have to coordinate the shopping list for the next day and the next day and the next. So this wasn't quite, um, we didn't have Instacart yet and we, and Fresh Direct was like just starting out. So I didn't have that kind of convenience delivery. So I was going to the stores myself, which was really hard. Uh, we have grand finale finishers, which is all the um, sauces and crumbles and sprinkles. I think, I, I like to have a heavy emphasis on condiments um, because you can have an egg like 20 ways if you have like sambal, chili crisp, pesto, like chicken dust is something I invented uh, for, for the cookbook. Um, miso pesto, oils, like these are all the fancy things that you can keep in the fridge for a long time to like spice up your, your meals. Like pickled chive buds, mustard creme, that actually only lasts like a couple days, but Shermula, which is one of the, my favorite new kinds of pesto. Lovely. Kimchi apples. Yum, yum, yum. And then the last chapter is not a typical dessert chapter. Like most people focus on sweet, 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 but I don't have a sweet tooth <laughs> really. So I only have like a few sweet things that I know how to make. And then the rest is cheese. <laughs> yeah. So this is something I make a lot. Chocolate bark. It's something I make all the time. My clients love my chocolate bark. Um, and I've, I've since gotten my own dehydrator, so I'm able to control the shapes of the fruits and like design chocolate bark custom to an event. Like, so say that um, an event host has red branding in their logo, I will skew toward plums or like even tomato uh, dried tomato to put on a chocolate bark, you know, or um, if they love like berries, I'll dry berries for them. And so I, I've, I've evolved the way that I make chocolate bark. It's really, really fun. I've even done pretzels and like um, melted chocolate on top, which is fun. Uh, berry shortcake and then lots of cheese, how to make labna. Um, this recipe here doesn't look, it looks very unassuming. It's the queso fundido. 
uh, Shropshire Blue Queso Fundido. This is a recipe that I had that I made on Guy's Grocery Games. I don't really tell people about that, but um, yeah, this is the recipe from the show that I did. <laughs> I didn't put the ice cream in here because I didn't think um, ice cream maker was a common tool. Um, but yeah, also don't ignore the back of the book. Uh, there's tools and travel kit if you want to bike picnic or um, take your food to go. Uh, staying organized. I have like a template of a spreadsheet that I use for, for planning my uh, cooking events. I got menus and party ideas. So I pulled some of the recipes together into menus so that you can like have a night of it instead of just making one recipe from the book. Um, and then there's a page about homework. Homework. Boy, it's not a gen project if there's no homework. It's a reading list of the books that influenced this book. So I'll tell you right now if you want to add it to your Goodreads. Uh, Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential, obviously. Um, Bill Buford's Heat. Uh, Amy Bessa and Romy Dotaran's Memories of a Philippine Kitchen. Uh, Escoffier, uh, the Escoffier cookbook, um, Gabrielle Hamilton's Blood, Bones, and Butter. That one's more of a memoir, uh, not so much a cookbook. Um, Gabrielle Hamilton um, recently came under fire. I have a lot of opinions about her, but her book is still great. Uh, it illustrates that um, you can do two careers at once, which is, is something that I care about. Uh, so she went to grad school for writing and open a restaurant. So you can you can do both, you know. Um, Steve Jenkins, the cheese primer is always great for your shelf. If you like, if you like cheese, it's kind of like a, a visual checklist of cheeses you can try. Uh, we have Karen Page and Andrew Dornenberg, the flavor Bible. This is something I've mentioned several times on the, on the stream. The flavor Bible is how I know how to pair things. It's great. It re it literally lists every ingredient and then it has a column of ingredients that will go with it. Uh, Jacques Pepin, uh, The New Complete Techniques. That's like a French uh, technique book uh, in lieu of culinary school. Going through the entirety of Jacques Pepin's book uh, will be really helpful. And then uh, Michael Rollman and Brian Polson, Charcuterie, uh, which is how I learned how to smoke and cure meats. Yeah. So that's my cookbook in a nutshell. And um, it's on sale on Etsy. Thank you to those of you who have bought it already. I really appreciate you. If you ever have any questions about it or if you spot something wrong in the book, uh, let me know. I will happily like tweet it out and be like, there's an error on page 76, you know. <laughs> oh, Lucius, you've read Kitchen Confidential. Yes, yes. I think what I related to most when I was reading, that was the book that, that uh, convinced me to go to culinary school, but then halfway through culinary school, I dropped out because I realized Anthony Bourdain's journey was not my journey. <laughs> but I do, I did associate and like the idea of camaraderie and um, related to uh, the suffering of it, like the long hours and, and um, putting in the work. It's worth it, you know? Uh, you know, I don't relate to the drug part of the book, but, but still, uh, I fondly miss Anthony Bourdain and wonder what he would say about 2020 if you were still around. Goodness. But anyway, uh, so that was my cookbook. We also looked at the Vermont Creamery pamphlet uh, about goat cheese and then this Kickstarter zine uh, called Stock Tips by Rachel and Amy. Uh, that was great, guys. Thank you for hanging out with me. Uh, let me know, tag me on Instagram and Twitter. Let me know what you've been reading this week so I can show other people next stream. I'll be back on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. I think we're talking about noodles, right? I feel like we are. I'll double check. Wednesday, 5 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch a Twitch. We are going to be talking about... Where is it? Noodles, parsley, and pork chops. That's what we'll be talking about on Wednesday. So bring your questions. Tag me in your cooking photos this week. I love showing the work on the stream. It also doesn't have to be, you know, a cookbook quality level. It could be food that you're having for breakfast, uh, something cool you saw at the farmer's market, uh, anything. I, I like sharing food. I like 
trying to help. If you have trouble cooking, always ask me questions on Twitter and Instagram. So friends, I hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. I think I'm going to nap before I deliver some food this afternoon. Uh, I hope you have a relaxing time, get some rest, and I'll see you Wednesday at 5 p.m. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Nice to see you. Bye.